Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a, a great pleasure to be here today to talk a little bit about how Christianity has shaped our politics for the better. Now, it's always a disappointment when your idols fail you. You think so very highly of them. You invest so much in them. And then they do or say something that shatters your illusions. I suffered this fate earlier this year when coming to the end of the second volume of Jonathan Israel's massive History of the Enlightenment. Now, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of reading this work, it is a three-volume publication spread out over ten years and about 3,000 pages, covering the birth of the modern modern world from about 1650 to the French Revolution. It's a very, very good book, or series of books. But about two-thirds of the way through this behemoth, I was turning pages eagerly and impressed, if not always persuaded by the scholarship, when I came across the following two sentences. Parenthetically, (coughs) it may be worth adding that nothing could be more fundamentally mistaken as well as politically injudicious than for the European Union to endorse the deeply mistaken notion that European values, if not nationally particular, are at least religiously specific and should be recognised as essentially Christian values. That the religion of the papacy, inquisition and puritanism should be labelled as the quintessence of Europeanness would rightly be considered a wholly unacceptable affront by a great majority of thoroughly European Europeans. I shall not repeat what I wrote in the margin of my book. Now, this statement did not come out of thin air. Israel's big thesis is essentially that we owe everything that characterises our modern political settlement. So that's democracy, equality, individual freedom, full toleration, liberty of expression, anti-colonialism, universalist secular morality. We owe all that, not just to the Enlightenment, but to the radical, atheistic, materialistic enlightenment, and behind that, primarily to the ideas of the philosopher Benedict Spinoza. As I said, I wasn't wholly convinced by this argument, but I could not but stand in awe of its erudition. Until, that is, I came to those sentences which, let's be honest, are not much more than a sneer of prejudice and ignorance. The fact that somebody capable of writing with such magnificent attention to detail in the history of ideas can turn on a sixpence and join the Richard Dawkins School of Historical Sophistication (laughs) in which the only thing Christianity is to be remembered for is the papacy, the Inquisition and Puritanism should serve to remind us that all of us at some time fall short of the glory of God. Now, I suppose one could be charitable and argue that on the basis that when you are a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, when you are an Enlightenment historian who sincerely believes that everything worthwhile in the modern world comes from the Enlightenment, you are bound to downplay or to dismiss that which casts doubt on your thesis. But that would be charitable. How, in all honesty, can anyone genuinely believe that? It's on a par with the idea that just because the medieval world had no equality in human rights commission or welfare state, it was little more than a cesspit of unwashed barbarism. It wasn't, of course. But, in the spirit of energetically responding to such views, it is important not to fall into the alternative error, the one that lurks, as it were, at the other end of the spectrum, and to make out that we owe all our political liberties and structures to Christianity and Christianity alone. We don't. Christianity has not always been used on the side of the political angels. Far from it. The Christian scriptures have been used by many over the centuries to justify political disenfranchisement, subservience and inequality. It is sobering to remember that one of the reasons why the abolitionist campaign was so thoroughly biblical in tone and content was that there were genuine, faithful and sincere Christians who argued for the transatlantic slave trade on biblical grounds. History is just not that simple. 
and if treated honestly it will not allow us to mine it for diamonds simply to set in our polemical crowns. Christians and the church have disappointed time and time again. So, we can begin with two errors to avoid. The politics owes everything to Christianity story and the politics owes everything to its escape from Christianity story. That acknowledge, I suspect that aside from polemicists, no one seriously entertains either of these arguments and that in as far as they are intellectual ditches that we must avoid falling into, they lie on the very edges of our path. You have to have meandered quite a long way from common sense to fall into them. More treacherous is a third error, which may be described as the argument that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whichever society came to believe in him should have free and fair elections and proper scrutiny of the executive. <laughs> this is the Jesus came to bring us all democracy argument, or less preposterously, the idea that the authentication of Christianity's goodness and truth is in that it conforms to our late modern liberal democratic norms. And this is a particularly easy error to fall into in a talk such as this one. Well, now natural categories for analysis are contemporary political ones. If we are asking how Christianity shaped our politics for the better, we are liable to start with our politics and then explore what Christianity has done to foster that. It's something that I've done before, indeed frequently, to be honest with you, particularly a couple of years ago during the 400th anniversary of the publication of the King James version, when I did a number of speaking events when I spoke about how the Bible helped shape things like national identity, commitment to democracy, equality and the like. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but there is something of a danger of allowing the democratic tail to wag the spiritual dog. So, to avoid it, I would like to do something a little bit riskier today. <coughs> sacrificing a measure of political clarity and a tweetable headline for a more authentic approach by looking at three elements within the Christian scriptures and tradition and outlining, albeit very briefly, how each of those have shaped our politics for the better. So first, and most substantially, the second two points are much shorter. Picking up nicely from where Roger took us a commitment to the inherent and equal human worth and dignity. This is foundational to both the creation and the recreation narratives of the Bible. Genesis 1, 26-27, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, is, I would argue, the most significant influential biblical text in Western political history. And it's not, of course, on the surface of it, a political text at all. But it has been used repeatedly and powerfully through history to justify both human equality and human dignity. The recreation story of the New Testament is less readily reduced to a couple of verses, but its effect has been just as powerful. Just as all are made in the image of God, all are remade, or given the gift of redemption and recreation by the same God. Just as God made all in his image, so Christ gives us all his image to replace the broken original. That image of Christ is a powerful one. The fact that the fullest picture we have of God, according to Christian thought, is of a broken, powerless criminal, has had an incalculable effect on the Western mind. In Roman legal usage, your personhood depended primarily on your status before the law. Those from the lowest social strata, such as slaves, criminals and the destitute, usually had no personhood, no rights, no formal means of legal appeal, no way of exercising power, no effective social presence. This helps explain the power of Christ's appearance before Pilate, 
within the legal constraints of the time, Christ has no claim on Pilate's clemency. Indeed, he has no real personhood before the law at all. Hence, Pilate's question, where do you come from, was as much an inquiry about the prisoner's social status, or his lack of it, as it was about his provenance. Pilate has the right to question, to scourge, to kill, and there is nothing, legally speaking, that Jesus can do about it. Which is why <coughs> Jesus' response, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above, is so shocking and so transformative. Because what this trial does is to assert that not only is the humiliated subject in the encounter in fact a person, but remarkably it is in that person that we find true authority. Now the cynic will instantly come back and say, so what? Fat lot of good it did the cause of equality over the next millennium or so. And the Christian will reply, will reply Amen, or at least Amen in part. The imperial and early medieval church was not exactly heroic in its vision of the social implications of its creed, as David Bentley Hart has recently argued. And yet, for its acknowledged failings, the seed was sown, and the flowers, slight, slow and fragile as they were, grew. Take, perhaps, the single most difficult and contentious issue that's often raised in this debate, slavery. Ever since Constantine had granted the church the power of manumission, Christians had often emancipated slaves in numbers, particularly around Easter time. The church father John Chrysostom spoke of a perfect, although probably eschatological, society in which no one would rule over others. He celebrated the extension of legal rights and protections to slaves and fulminated against Christian masters who dared to humiliate their slaves. More remarkably still, Gregory of Nyssa fulminated against the institution of slavery itself, denouncing all Christians for daring to imagine that they can own another human being when such a right belonged to God alone. An extreme position in the church at the time, an unheard of one outside it. The institution died a slow death in the Middle Ages, not least because of repeated ecclesiastical prohibitions, but it was reborn in a newly horrific way with the birth of the transatlantic slave trade at the end of the 17th century. As I mentioned earlier, this was something that a great many Christians acquiesced to. And the only sustained opposition in the early days came from those like the Quakers who were already, already on the periphery of political life. However, when the abolitionist campaign really did take off in the 1780s, evangelicals in particular played a lead role and their arguments, when they deemed it appropriate in public, were thoroughly biblical. Oh fool, exclaims the freed slave and abolitionist, abolitionist Oloda Equiano refuting the idea in his book that the Negro race is an inferior species. See the 17th chapter of Acts, verse 26. God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Arguments like that were needed to undermine the institution. There is a great deal more to inherent dignity and equality than simply not being a slave, though. And two other consequences of this foundational understanding of human nature are relevant. First, there is the question of political equality. There are certain specific biblical roots for the idea of political equality that go beyond the creation and recreation narratives I just mentioned. Actually, more accurately, there are certain specific biblical roots that have been used to justify political equality, such as Paul's teaching about equal roles within the body of Christ. <coughs> However, once again, it's this foundational concept of human dignity and equality that proved most influential. <coughs> it was here that lay the basis of John Ball's aggressively egalitarian preaching during the Peasants' Revolt in the late 14th century, when Adam delved, Doug, and Eve Spann, who was then the gentleman 
what hierarchy was there in Eden exactly? A couplet, among other things, that earned him a particularly gruesome death. It was here more influentially, as Roger mentioned, that we find the basis for John Locke's far more sophisticated argument in the first treatise on government, in which he took on and then methodically demolished Robert Filmer's argument that political inequality was built into creation. As far as Locke was concerned, drawing on the arguments that he made in the first treatise, which is really the most biblical of all English political texts, equality rather than hierarchy was the intended (coughs) order of things, which meant that government should be by consent rather than by subservience. Whether government by consent entails democracy is another question to which I shall return. The other consequence is material equality. It's perfectly possible for people to have some form of social and political equality and yet to remain profoundly unequal. Here, once again, one is overwhelmed by the biblical material. Assuming one skirts over the material implications in the creation narrative and in the fact that Jesus came in the form of a servant, one might mention the Torah's legislation making provision for and exhorting munificence towards the poor. (coughs) The Jubilee commands intended to maintain an equitable share in the land for all. The prophetic denunciations against the exploitation of the poor. Jesus' ministry among the poor, the early church's distribution of goods among the poor, the list goes on and on and on. Given this wealth of scriptural material, one might lament the church's failure to alleviate the burden of poverty more than it did. Although here there would be even less justification for doing so than there is in terms of lamenting the church's attitude to slavery. Early Christian teaching placed charity at the centre of spiritual life in a way that no pagan cult had ever done. Raising care of widows, orphans, sick, imprisoned and poor to the status of supreme spiritual obligation. In the late second century, Tertullian boasted that whereas once upon a time money dedicated to pagan gods was squandered on feasting and drinking, now money given to the church was used to the, for the care of the impoverished and the abandoned and the elderly and in those in need of a decent burial. He was boasting and he was making a polemical point, but he was also telling the truth. It was something, by way of mention in passing, that pagans too recognised and envied. Oft quoted are the words of the last pagan emperor, Julian the Apostate, who wrote, It is disgraceful that no Jew is a beggar, and the impious Galileans, his word for the Christians, support our poor in addition to their own. Now precisely how this commitment to material equality translated into political action is a massive and many coloured story. There are certainly moments of indifference towards poverty in Christian history, some of resignation, some informed by an idea that material inequality, however gross, is divinely ordained or even a punishment. (laughs) Nevertheless, These have always been, in truth, discordant voices within the full Christian chorus, which has never strayed that far from its founder's care for the poor. (coughs) There are other forms of equality I might mention here, such as legal equality, which is also highlighted in the Torah, but hopefully my fundamental point, first point, is clear. If we are seeking an answer to the question, how did Christianity shape our politics for the better, the primary place to start is in how Christian thought brought inalienable dignity, rounded (coughs) equality and fundamental personhood to all. For those modern thinkers who fail to recognise its achievement in all this, imagining either that such values are natural or believing that they are rooted in nothing deeper than the late Enlightenment, it's worth asking a few questions. (coughs) 
Why did so many in the ancient world think slave and free were so different as to be almost different creatures? Why did so many in the modern post-Darwinian world think that different races, even if they were all human and from the same stock, and some doubted even that, were so different as to be different species almost? Why did the encyclopedia, the great monument of the Radical Enlightenment, under the entry for multitude, tell its readers that in intellectual questions the mass's voice is full of malignity, stupidity, inhumanity, perversity, prejudice. It is ignorant and idiotic. Beware of it in its moral questions. It is incapable of noble or strong deeds. They are awkward questions for people who believe that equality just comes naturally to us. It does not, alas, grow in the soil of the human heart naturally. It is, I think, one of the profoundest gifts Christianity has given to modern politics. So, that leads me to my second, and you'll be glad to hear briefer points, which I've already skirted around. A Christian commitment to such social and material equality has not always translated to the political order. In other words, for all Christians have talked up equality, many have been reluctant to use the state to bring it about. Now this is not the time to go into the question of what, according to Christian thought, is the proper function of the state. Although that is a question I would argue that we have not wrestled with sufficiently in our theology over the last 200 years or so. I do want to make the point that the limitation of political power is one of the most powerful and important legacies of Christian thought to the West. Now this is not, just to make myself absolutely clear at this precise moment in our history, a plea for Thatterite small government made on theological grounds. It has a more substantive point that government has limits. One might mention in terms of Christianity's uh, sources for such an argument, the nation of Israel's early Old Testament Israel's distinctly dubious relationship with kingship, which began with a warning, endured malpractice and ended in disaster. One might mention early Israel's very high opinion of the law and the way in which, when assuming the throne, the king was required to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law read it all the days of his life, follow carefully all the words and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites. <coughs> Excuse me. One might return to John 19 and to Jesus' warning to Pilate that he too was under authority, highly improbable as that would have seemed to the governor at the time. One might refer to Paul's discourse in government, on government in Romans 13, so high in its view of obedience, but also which calls the powers that be God's servants three times. One might observe the existence of the church as a material and a political body within society, often confronting and even denying the powers that be. Or one might mention the simple fact that the whole witness of scripture is that God alone is sovereign that there is, to borrow the title of Madeleine Albright's book, The Mighty and the Almighty. Whichever one you use, the conclusion remains the same. No matter how highly they think of themselves, rulers are ruled. What precisely they are ruled by, I will turn to shortly in my final point. But before doing so, it's worth working out, worth looking rather at briefly how this has worked itself out in different cultures. In the early years of institutional Christianity, it meant taming the imperial role, which the church did with greater and lesser success. In the early medieval period, it meant reminding the new, more localised rulers, whose kingdoms spread out through the west of Europe, that properly speaking, kings were made kings not by force of arms or even technically by inheritance, but by the abundant goodness of God 
In the later medieval period, it led to the epochal confrontation between the papacy and the empire, in which the church stood as an independent empire that straddled Europe and claimed the right to depose monarchs. In the more modern period, it's meant taking a stand, often a very costly one, against totalitarian ideas and states, which have sought to impose order, security, <coughs> equality and happiness on their unwilling people. <coughs> In the interest of balance, it's only fair to say that is a one-sided story. We might just equally talk about the Church's validation of the Emperor's authority in the Eastern Empire, the qualified validation of pretty much every king's authority in Latin Christendom, the unquestioning support of princely power in the early magisterial reformation, or the cultural allegiance of throne and altar that dominated Europe right up to the First World War. Like I said, history does not allow us to pick and choose our stories. My point here is that in spite of all these political weeds that have miraculously sprouted from this particular theological seed, the most sustained and truest legacy of the Gospel to the political West is that government, whilst legitimate, must also be limited. Thirdly, legitimacy, which brings me to my final point. If political authority was legitimate, what legitimised it? What, in short, was it there for? There were, and as I've mentioned, there are different answers to this question. And it's fair to say there's been a degree of evolution in the Church's response to it. The short answer, though, is I think the same in the 21st century as it was in the first. It is to do justice. If kings and emperors were only made rulers on account of God's goodness, it meant they had to pay attention to his terms and conditions. And his terms and conditions were, in effect, do justice. Now, precisely what justice entailed is a very big issue. But broadly speaking, it involved protection from external threats, defence, protection from internal threats, law and order, and more hesitantly, securing the good of subjects, meaning primarily, for much of our history, the defence and advancement of the Church as the vehicle for the earthly well-being and eternal salvation of all people. It is quite obvious where that went wrong at times. Only if a king did this could he rightfully claim the mantle of kingship. Only then could his power be thought of as authority. Of course, it took many centuries for the full implications of this to be worked out, but the direction of travel is visible quite early on. In the 10th century, an Anglo-Saxon monk called Alfric wrote a homily for Palm Sunday in which he said this, <coughs> No man can make himself king, but the people has a choice to choose a king whom they please. But after he is consecrated as king, he has dominion over his people and they cannot shake his yoke from their necks. That's a quite extraordinary statement for the 10th century, rather similar to democracy. The people have the choice to choose their king, but can't just kick him out when they change their mind. Eventually, the crazy idea that the people themselves should have some say in what constituted public justice worked its way into Christian thought. Although, again, in the spirit of honesty, it's important to recognise that it often did so in defiance of Christian convictions. A lot of Christians argue, <coughs> if there was a right way to govern and a wrong way to govern, why risk letting people choose the wrong way? That was certainly thinking of the Anglican bishops, most of whom opposed the Great Reform Act of 1832, until furious crowds demanding disestablishment and attacking our Episcopal palaces helped change their minds. <laughs> in reality, the idea that people should have a say in the way they were governed had more to, the spirit, more to do with the spiritual democracy inherent in a lot of Reformation thought than in any more specifically political strands. Put simply, in the words of one 19th century radical who was arguing for the great reform, 
If God considered even the humblest man competent to judge for himself the means of eternal salvation, and government is simply the means of temporal salvation, it follows that government should involve people in the formation of its laws. If, God's, if God trusts us, governments should. So, by way of drawing the strands together, I think there may be others, but I've chose to focus on three particular ways that Christianity has shaped our politics for the better. Firstly, a commitment to the inherent, inviolable and equal dignity and worth of all humans. Second, the conviction that government, while legitimate, must also be limited as it comes under the judgment of a still greater authority. And thirdly, that government is ultimately made legitimate by its fidelity to an idea of justice that included, in some measure, the good of the people. This, as I've said, is self-evidently not the whole story of the Christian political presence in the West. However, it is, I think, the truest political story, the one that remains most faithful to the life, death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, and without which not only would the West have been incalculably different, but would, in my opinion, have been very much less humane. Thank you very much.